So let's, uh, let's get started. It's a pleasure to have with us today Dr. Eric Horvitz. Uh, Eric actually is the director of the Microsoft Research Lab at Redmond. Uh, his main interest is in artificial intelligence and its applications. Uh, that includes decision making under uncertainty, machine learning, bond, and rationality, and information retrieval. Uh, he's worked and collaborated on projects that were fielded in a number of areas, including healthcare, transportation, online services, and aerospace. Uh, he's won a number of awards, and he's a fellow of many organizations. I'm just going to sample a couple Feigenbaum Prize for uh, contributions in AI and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He was also uh, a president of uh, Super AI, the American uh, or the Association for the Advancement of AI. Uh, last but not least, if you're interested in hearing about some of his uh, philanthropic activities, you may want to look up later his effort in the 100-year um, study on AI, uh, AI 100. And Eric became a grandfather today. So please uh, ah. join me in welcome. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> About an hour ago, yes, I got a, a text message. So we were actually in the Bay Area at a conference and workshop last week around the due date. And it was very, we thought very serendipitous we were going to be down there. But of course, that didn't happen. But today, we had a little good luck. Thank you, Adnan and the group here. So I wanted to first uh, talk about Microsoft Research, um, uh, um, give you a sense for where things are there. Um, we're about 1,200 uh, research scientists and engineers uh, uh, and support people uh, at six sites around the world. Um, and we've had the same mission over the last uh, 23 years or so, since um, 24 years or so, since David Heckerman, who's uh, an adjunct at UCLA, and I arrived together uh, uh, to help to form what became Microsoft Research. I think we were like maybe like 9, 10, and 11 there. Jack Breeze was the third one. We were part of a startup at the time and just finished up grad school. I think David had started as a professor at UCLA at the time, right? So, a little bit loud here. So, um, the basic mission is expand the state of the art with, without regard to thinking about Microsoft products and so on, but typically people are motivated um, and everyone always wants to get their, their stuff out into the world to rapidly transfer innovations. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting to get uh, ideas and, and, and features into products that are used by many people. So I like to start by, this is a little bit of feedback here on this mic, I like to start by saying that uh, sort of the golden uh, kind of arrow here is going from sense data to predictive models. Um, and many people stop here and they say, this is what I do for a living. Um, but uh, as decision scientists, we like to go to the, where the rubber meets the road into action in the world. And, to always consider this data to, to decisions to prediction pipeline. Once you do this well, if you have a good objective function here, uh, you can start thinking backwards from the objective function up to valuing data. What's the value of getting more data to make a better decision uh, and do active sensing in real time as well as for, for, for learning purposes, looking at learning curves and so on. So this is the kind of like the kind of overall mantra that, you know, sort of how I live my life over the last last uh, 30 years or so, and uh, I, I always like to say, to say we want to go beyond just the, the probability distributions uh, and from classifiers and think about action in the world, decision making. And I wanted to start here at the, uh, the sort of the old days that uh, when Adnan and David Heckerman and I and others, uh, Uta Pearl, were in the mid-80s uh, building these models by hand. This model was built by someone named Ingo Beinleck working with an expert. I think it took them about three weeks to, to actually assess this model for an intensive care unit by hand, uh, drawing the random variables out and the arcs uh, representing um, probabilistic dependencies uh, and influences. And the basic idea was once you built one of these by hand, you just actually assess the, the tables of probabilities <coughs> underneath these graphs. And it would take quite a while getting expert knowledge. Uh, and uh, it was very exciting to, to basically take uh, algorithms to walk over these graphs. And for any set of observations, in an ICU, for example, blood pressure or, or um, arterial CO2, you could make inferences about things like pulmonary emboli, emboli or kink tubes. And I was really excited about applying these kinds of models to time critical decision, decision making. Um, I've always been interested in this idea of time pressure uh, and, and uh, as pushing on, on kind of the, the, the limits of, of systems to compute. In those days, we actually had some limits even for those kinds of models to compute very quickly. Um, and of course, over the last 
35 years or so, we've, we've gotten copious amounts of data now as, as the web became part of life. Uh, and, um, and algorithms that were developed by people like David Heckerman and, and, and um, uh, Yuta Pearl, Danny Geiger and others like structure learning uh, where you can walk over data and actually infer structure are now part of life. Uh, being able to build these models from, from, from actually from data sets. That changes everything and the world has changed around that. And it's interesting at MSR, I like to point out that it's not only about algorithms, it's about designs. So here's an example where Andy Wilson uh, on our team was found a 3D camera about 15 years ago and was playing with it and said, yeah, it looks like I have some interesting, interesting ideas about it, new kinds of experiences that might be, we might build out someday into gaming environments. And at the same time in our Cambridge lab, we had people using um, uh, Markov Random Fields, uh, Andrew Blake's group with Jamie Shotton, uh, looking at how to dynamically train and tag video uh, as well as uh, imagery uh, with those models, those graphical models. And someone had the idea, well, we can actually think about, instead of tagging grass and sheep, we can start thinking about tagging parts of the human body. Uh, and with, with a combination of real data and simulated data, um, uh, taking Andy's ideas, making them more robust, and starting out to sort of build systems that could do, be used in living rooms, for example, and be pretty robust. This is an early version. It's kind of a hacky version of what became the Kinect. And so it's a combination of the design and the, and the machine learning together, I think, that really goes a long way to make robust systems we can now use. Uh, just to give you a sense where things are going now, this is a, a, some more late-breaking work to show you how far we've come over the last even seven or eight years this is not a video, this is actually a model being inferred of hand pose. And I've, I've often reflected that if you could get thumb and forefinger into computation, you know, homo sapien thumb and forefinger, you can build cities. And so here we are now uh, being able to uh, literally do a dynamic fielding of, or, or inferences about finger pose at a distance. Someday you can just gesture to your systems here and do that kind of work. And this is a work being, being featured at SIGGRAPH this year. And we also see other applications in, in daily life. This is some work from my team that's shipping in Cortana. You know, we, all, we often um, uh, uh, send email to others promising commitments of various kinds. This is one of my commitments that Cortana has discovered in, in, a, in a version internally right now. Uh, and the idea is I can actually now have the system actually remind me, uh, based on place or location, to take care of my commitments. And uh, this came out of a real, <laughs> real world uh, application um, where I just make too many commitments and I say yes too often and I need to keep track of these things before people tell me, you promised me those slides by Thursday. So now we're seeing machine reading going on and doing inferences about various aspects of your life. Commitments are kind of a fabric of, of, of collaboration. So it's a, it, we also do requests and, uh, and as well as incoming commitments as well. So um, um, over the last uh, seven years or so, we've had a kind of a jump in learning prowess. And I like to say that uh, it's interesting to see what's going on with the convolutional neural networks. Um, actually, the work uh, many, people, many of you know started at, at Microsoft Research in the summer when Jeff Hinton and some grad students visited us and took some older methods that had been around for a while and with, with a little bit of polish and started applying larger data sets and speech, uh, speech data in particular. And to give you a sense for what this, this particular, uh, these advances meant, Early on, this is um, showing you um, uh, word error recognition rate on the, on the y-axis over time. And notice that uh, people are, were hammering on this data set called switchboard challenge. The switchboard data set challenge is, um, if you don't know, it's a, it, it was a, a data set collected by an unnamed uh, government, US government agency who wanted to see, uh, create a data set of people talking on low bandwidth phone lines. Um, and they would pay people to actually make these conversations. Uh, I say unnamed because you can imagine the uses this might have in national security. But this is an interesting uh, course data set of people chattering on phones. And notice in 2000, people were hammering on this data set and they couldn't get that word error recognition rate lower. But with, with deep nets, that summer at Microsoft Research, we showed this big jump down, uh, impressive. For, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the community that, that really enabled new kinds of services. Now, you, you often think that, you know, what does that kind of jump mean? Well, it means going from not being able to do this to being able to do real-time translation because the Skype translator, for example, depends on uh, uh, several uh, uh, pieces in a workflow, each of which is now X percent better. And right when 
we did the first version of this uh, displayed at Qinzhen in, in, in China. We had Rick Brasher on stage doing a live real-time translation. We barely could do this. It was, we were all saying it's probably not going to work. It actually worked, but it was at the edge of doability. And now it's, this, these, these, this product is being fielded to consumers. And we also see other kinds of pipelines, rich pipelines now. Many of you know about the captioning work now um, that involve um, deep learning that's combining language uh, information with um, visual information into, into rich pipelines. So this is actually what you see here is the computer guessing after a little bit of source code here, the computer guessing an open laptop computer sitting on top of a desk. Here's the human caption. And it does pretty well. A man doing a trick on a skateboard. And that's the human in blue. Once in a while it messes up. You know, this is a, the system thought is a fire hydrant on the side of a road, and humans know about the nuances of life. They can actually do the real-time parsing here. Um, but what I have to say is that these kinds of te technologies are now being used in new ways. And um, uh, I noticed that the system thought this was a, a dog. But you see the cat's actually in its trace there. It just didn't make it up to the top. And to give you an example, and this is, a, I have to say, uh, pardon the, um, the, the music on this video. Uh, and pardon the fact that we, we show some really nice cases, but it gives you a taste of where things are going uh, with, with pipelines of the future based on these technologies. This is actually real stuff running, but it's, uh, again, uh, let, me, let, me, let me come up with the audio here. We have our, our audio. Here we go. We got it. So that's a, a, a prototype, but we're actually going to be investing in that and taking it forward to, to make it a more of a usable daily life thing for the sight impaired. I found it interesting that uh, what's going on over the last few years is that systems people have gotten into the fray with machine learning. And many of you know this. It's, uh, I just visited today with, with uh, uh, folks here doing uh, F FPGAs and new kinds of hardware for, for convolutional neural nets. But in general, even server farms, I mean, to hear people like uh, like our systems people or people at Google talking about parameter servers and how you do them well to do machine learning across a cluster is very interesting and exciting in some ways. Um, these are some pictures coming out of different, different uh, you know, sort of uh, systems guides now to how to do machine learning on a large scale cluster. Very interesting to see. And we're seeing new kinds of tools and platform 
kinds of plays being made in this space. So Microsoft recently put out this cognitive services uh, um, API. Uh, and you can sort of you know, program in these, these kind of functionalities you see now just as, as part of your coding experience and not have to build your own uh, you know, sort of deep neural net vision system to do things like surprise and age and so on. So I wanted to just talk about three case studies now, three project area, three, three directions um, that I think are, are kind of just exciting indicators of where things are going. They're just three of a bigger space, and many of you here I, thought, I heard today are working on really interesting related problems. Uh, first is transportation. So a number of years ago, I was very excited about traffic. You know, it seemed like a very simple, basic application that, uh, you know, it's just about 12 years ago now. Um, Seattle has terrible traffic, uh, probably as bad as LA, because it has less, less infrastructure, I think. And, uh, um, but we, we can easily get access to sensors and roadways. We can get access to, wind, to weather feeds, major games. And we got access to these kind of telegraphic reports that are coming out of the Washington Department of Transportation here. I can show you an example. And combine these into, with graphical, in this case, uh, we did structure search and build, build these predictive models that were basically put up on uh, these old smartphones of their time, little disks here, uh, showing um, how much time until uh, clogs would melt or how much time with this green disk until, until, uh, until flows would become clogged. This was very exciting to people. We actually, people were buying this app, were buying phones just to have the app in those days, as I recall. And so we had like max likely durations being shown there. There's a UAI paper. And one thing that came to the fore at the time was that it, was, it wasn't all about just the world state we were making inferences about. I wanted to mention here, here. so I'm going to, for each of these areas, I'm going to talk a little bit about considerations that come to the fore with these applications. So it was also about people, too. So the work we were doing back then was predicting state of the world state of the traffic system, for example. And so when, when we built these models, when we had sensor information, we could sort of generate probability distributions over the roadway system, for example. But we also said, well, you know, listen, the pe people in Seattle fashion themselves as traffic experts. It's a rainy day, for example, uh, and, they, and it's rush hour. They sort of know, without looking at a device, what's going on, and they have their own probability distribution. They don't need to be told by a smart device. But we said, well, wait a minute, let's gather data about people and what they expect and let's build models about what people expect, and now we can estimate what people are thinking. And the idea basically is to take these estimates of what people think and what the, uh, about what the world is like, and together use that to do ideal <coughs> alerting, for example. And so this led to work about going beyond predicting traffic flows, for example, and predicting what people might think over time, including surprise models. What will surprise somebody? And using this to actually do alerting, for example, uh, and putting up certain kinds of alerts and buzzes that, that there'll be a surprise that you, as a Seattle seasoned expert, won't expect 30 minutes from now or an hour from now about the traffic on your commute home. So the, the, the power of user models running side by side with world state models. So this work was scaled up uh, through, through a project called ClearFlow. In those days, we, we collected lots of data and built like a sort of a recommender engine for all streets in Seattle. Um, that can be used with, to power up an A-star search to give traffic uh, throughout the whole system that would combine different kinds of relationships, including topology, weather, proximal resources, uh, number of red lights per, per kilometer, and so on. And this work um, uh, went, after we tested and showed how good it was, into uh, a large-scale Bing service for uh, traffic flows. Uh, this is a 2008 article in the New York Times, and then we farmed this out to, to uh, 72 cities in the US and then later into the world. Uh, so just to show how we can sort of, we can scale up these methods that can be helpful to many people across the globe. Um, and this brings up this issue uh, whenever we do large scale data that I want to mention another consideration here, which is the idea of we're actually using user data. We have EULAs in place for this, but it's always the idea of, of trying to minimize the hit on, on, on humans in terms of the data that companies like Microsoft are using. And so I want to just, mention, just pause here for a second and talk about this idea of consideration of privacy, which is a whole other pillar of work that always goes along with our work on services. It's very important to think about to be minimally, minimally invasive. And this is work with Andreas Krauss uh, and others uh, when he was an intern with us. But the idea is we can sort of look at the traffic. And we're just looking at the, the highway system right now, the skeleton, but it's, it's for all of Seattle. And we can actually look at the, at the notion of um, uh, demand-weighted traffic. So you see here, the, but the width and the lightness of the color, how many cars are on the road at a particular time. And you see how 520 
bridge is being used, is, is demanded there. And the idea is if we had a, 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 a model of sensors, whether it be GPS or in-ground sensors for the highway system, and both a dependency model, um, we can actually do sensing under a budget in a way that would be utilitarian or demand-weighted, such that we actually are slanting and leaning the, 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 the evaluation of the information based on the, mo the maximal usage of the system by the whole community. So we call this whole the idea of community sensing, and the idea basically is you actually consider the phenomenon itself, the actual variance over all the, all the, all the regions, your current uncertainty, a demand model, the population needs at any point, at any point in time, and the availability, what sensors are out there right now that you can ping under a budget, for example. And the idea would be people can actually say, I, I want to be part of this community service. You can have 30 GPS points for me per month. Take the ones you need the most to help the whole system, community sensing. And, and community sensing is one piece of several uh, decision theoretic approaches we're taking to minimizing, we could minimally invasive sensing for the sake of all, for utilitarian uses. And you can see how, 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 how powerful the idea is optimizing what sensors you pick. This is demand-weighted variance on the, on the uh, y-axis here. And number of observations, for example. You can read about this in our paper on the web. Now, another consideration I want to bring up to this audience is the fact that we often don't have to do exotic things with moats and fancy, fancy new kinds of sensor networks and so on. We can harness existing infrastructure. So what you see here is a picture of where the, the NOAA, the wind service for the United States, or the weather service, I should say, launches balloons to track the winds at different heights for the, for, the, for, the, for the United States weather system and for guiding planes around the country. And what happens is they, they launch balloons at those triangle sites six times a day and, and sort of use satellite uh, links to the balloon to see what, what, what wind flows are like in these different places. But in reality, if we look up right now at this moment, this is what we see in the sky. I mean, so we have, these is, this is basically a bit, sort of a very representative view of the, the current assets of sensors in the sky. How can we harness these sensors? Well, uh, working directly with the FAA, we gained access to the two large-scale feeds of these, of these aircraft. Now, let's think about this. How do we sense the wind? Well, we tend to have ground radar tracks of planes, and that's about it. But, and so we actually, and so we also, um, we, so if you think about this, the triangle here, we want to compute the wind velocity which we don't know directly. We don't know the heading and airspeed because we can't see the tilt of the plane as it fights the winds. We sort of have some idea of, by the type of plane about the, 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 the speed or the, you know, the speed of a plane. Um, and the idea is, and here's the magical trick that we use, right? That nearby planes, even when they're traveling in different directions, if they're nearby each other, are experiencing the same winds. Turns out that we can solve two triangles like this by thinking through the, the system of, of equations and hidden variables. And so you have lots of little triangles here across the country. And we can build a graphical model. This is the plate notation, for those of you who are familiar with that, that, uh, takes, that looks at the actual um, aircraft observations here, the, the NOAA wind station observations, and uh, tries to combine them together in a coherent model to give us the wind at any point. And it turns out you can actually uh, do studies, and we did studies with holdout sets, but I have to show you this fun uh, project um, to launch balloons. I actually engaged my high school son and his friend at the time uh, to launch balloons with us uh, with satellite links. And the idea what you see here is that we, we, we sort of estimate where the balloon's going to land, go and land, based on NOAA data alone. Um, and th that's the, uh, the purple line here. And the black line here is the ground truth of where it actually went. And we actually say planes plus the wind data, what's called the loft data, how well we can predict where it goes. And you get a sense for it. I thought I'd just share you with you the fact that these balloons really do go up to where you can see the curvature of the Earth. It's kind of fun to look at. But um, so we can have fun with these projects while we do them. But this um, uh, led to the, a real cloud service. We call this the uh, Azure Windflow Cloud Service. And, uh, you can go on the site right now, which is at windflow.azurewebsites.net, and you can sort of see the NOAA view of the winds, the wind flow view, and the diffs. And we're working with a major airline right now who is interested in sucking, ingesting this data into their routing system, uh, and so to, to, to do better than the, what they can do with NOAA uh, 
inferences right now. I should say that this led to another consideration, which was another research project. You see how these projects grow upon each other as you go through, through uh, over time. Of if you have a plane flying and you have some priors and some inference, and the plane is doing sensing itself and also can do sensing if you put it in different locations, how do you do cost sensitive planning um, and sensing as the system moves through a wind field, for example? And you can read about our work on this problem called the Canadian Travelers Problem. They call this the Canadian Travelers Problem because can Canadian drivers and truckers get up to what they think is the shortest route and then the, the road is snowed in under uncertainty. They don't know it ahead of time. Uh, and so the basic idea is you can, we can see this is an Amos paper from a couple of years back, but the idea basically is you want to actually uh, sense and fly at the same time. And it's a combinatorial problem, but you can do some simulation and show how we can sort of cut through that, that hard space and actually do ideal paths. And this came out of that, early, that cloud flow work. So I wanted to move now to the second pillar, which is healthcare. Uh, people in this room I know are working on different aspects of this, and I'm going to put some basic problems here to show you the, some, some high payoff. So about, about uh, uh, six, seven years ago, we got access to the MedStar uh, um, uh, database, which is based in Washington, D.C. area. It's a large-scale hospital. Um, we made a strategic relationship with them, and we ended up with about, uh, now it's about 18 years of, of very fine-grained data, about 30,000 variables, um, all this text, uh, uh, chief complaint, uh, age, like diagnostic codes, um, fine-grained lab results and tests, locations of various things in hospitals, for example, um, even uh, fees and billing procedures. And at the same time, this is right when um, uh, this was a hot topic, and it still is, the readmissions challenge was coming to the fore. And the, uh, you probably remember that the, the Obama administration was excited about, can we just keep patients out of the hospital? Well, it turns out that this 2009 New England Journal article said that 20% of Medicare reimbursed patients would be, were bouncing back to hospitals after discharge within 30 days and 35% of them were bouncing back within 90 days. And the estimated avoidable cost was $17.5 billion from these readmissions. It's quite dramatic. So we just did some basic work to try to build models to, to do prediction. The typical notion is, that you all, many of you are familiar with, is you, you, any classifier has a true positive rate and a false positive rate. And we want to pick a threshold to operate at, given that we test and train, uh, for example. So we found we could capture like 26%. Uh, I mean, 78 percent or so, 76 percent of the true positives who would bounce back in advance of them at discharge time, at kind of a 26 percent false positive rate. So, how would you actually use this? Um, we also uh, several algorithms give us uh, insights into, as you know, into the actual what what are some discriminatory evidential features. So, heart failure we know is a revolving door illness, but the system is pointing out that staying 14 hours in the emergency room is not a good sign for staying out of the hospital, or uh, if the complaint sentence anywhere has the word fluid in it, it's a bad sign for staying out of the hospital. And it just does these interesting, even single words, we looked at bigrams and trigrams and so on. So we actually built a system called Readmissions Manager, referred to lovingly as RAM by hospitals that use the system. Uh, that's, that's, actually, that's actually live at a bunch of hospitals around, around the, uh, the world now. And what comes up is a probability of readmission in a column in the patient's chart, live, dynamically, and a little explanation based on the, the positive and negative uh, contributing features. And it turns out that hospitals are using this in a variety of ways. So this hospital in the Midwest says if the Microsoft score, they don't call it a probability, if the Microsoft score is greater than 25, do a special program. And they have a certain program of like a package, what they do to these patients, that they treat specially when they have this high readmissions risk score. And um, they compute that they're saving um, $1.4 million per year by doing this. So we said, well, listen, let's, instead of being heuristic about this, let's do some decision analysis. And so we actually sat down, and, and this is, I think, really important for people to do machine learning, to think through the objective function, down from the predictive model to the, to the, to the cost function. Um, and we looked at congestive heart failure in particular very carefully. This is a, a challenging illness. Um, if, if it keeps up the way it's going, Almost 10% of, of us will have this if they don't have it now by the time we, we reach 65 or beyond. And it's, cost, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very costly illness, about $35 billion per year to just care for this disease. And um, the decision is to reinvest in post-discharge programs for patients to keep them out of the hospital, given how hard it is to, to maintain these patients, manage them on their medications and their salt-free diets and so on. And so you can look at the literature and there's a whole bunch of 
work that's gone on in this space. Um, um, a wide range of programs and efficacies are reported. There's notions of you know, coordination, new kinds of outpatient visits, connected health, fancy scales. Uh, someone here I met with today is working on you know, smart scales and so on with the UCLA healthcare system. Um, and uh, you know, new kinds of applications, even bottles that control how much hydration, how much fluid people take in during the day. Um, and we said, let's, let's, do a, let's do a DA, a decision analysis. So we, ha we, we actually will have, we, we know we have a pretty good model that predicts probability distributions over patients, who's gonna bounce back. Let's go to the next level now. And so what we did was we actually uh, did a, a, a fine-grained cost analysis. You can read about this on our website uh, in our publication on this. But the basic idea was we ended up, up um, um, considering the costs and benefits of a program that would, that would be efficacious but would cost some money that would only be given to patients who had a certain risk level. Um, and then we ran a simulator with real patients, um, some of whom came back and some of whom didn't, uh, and when you do the simulation, you can actually do something like do exploration. So let's say you're a hospital administrator and you don't know how much this new package being promised to you will reduce readmission. A smart scale plus coordination with outpatient visits costs $7,000 and you want to give it to only patients at high risk, let's say, at some level of threshold. And you're not really sure how much it's going to reduce readmission, but you want to explore what the classifier would do running in a decision analysis in, in a hospital system. And so, so here is an example, if you don't know about the, the efficacy and dollar value, you might want to sort of do a, sense, do a parameter sweep over these values that you're uncertain about and, and see what, what would happen in your, in your system. So this shows you, if you run a simulator, and what we're doing is we're actually literally running the whole model with a cost function that, and that, that, let us, that, that lets us then say, hey listen, if I use this classifier with this true positive and false positive rate in this hospital, and you promising me that I could pay $800 and get a 35% efficacy reduction in, re in readmissions, what will I save? And it tells you, well, you will cut down your readmissions by 31.4% per simulator, and it'll cost, you only, you'll save 13.2%. Well, why only 13.2%? Because a bunch of the money is going into patients that are staying out anyway. So it's because they're not always guessing perfectly right. When you say, well, what about if I have a, this other pharmaceutical company, it says $1,800 per patient, and it's a 20% efficacy. Well, you know right away that, that's not gonna that you're not going to gain anything there. It's just going to cost you. So you can run a simulator with it. And, and so here's the cool thing, and I think it's really great. I've always wanted to do this all my life, actually. What's the, the expected value of dipping this crystal of machine intelligence into, into an existing hospital system? Right? So, what you're seeing here is like, it's kind of like the X-ray crystallography of intelligence, right? So saying, what's the value in a hospital of running a real-time predictor that's optimizing things? And the idea here is that you would never do anything here because this is all no-brainer, cheap and efficacious. This is stuff you would never do. But in the middle here, you see the shadows of rastering over each patient, thinking through it, and trying something and, and what, what the savings would be. So I think we should do this, we, the idea is there's a promise for doing this in large scale cyber social systems. What's the value of an intelligent system overlaid on an existing complicated uh, center like a hospital and a complicated disease process? Now one consideration I want to mention here just to say for direction is that we want to consider the influences of the system itself. And this we don't do enough. And when I read about literature, I discover that very few people have done causal analyses of what happens when you, when you sort of run a system that's going to be doing smart things and let's say uh, delegating uh, certain allocations of resources to risky patients. Turns out many of these patients are revolving door patients. So once you do an analysis on them and make, and make a decision and make an intervention, you're changing the distribution. You're changing the world and they come back again and, and typically people using the same classifier. So we have to be thinking about this idea of how do we propagate through data about the long-term histories of what our intelligence systems are doing to the world. What's their own influence and how do we model that? Another consideration is time and space, just to give you a sense for some, another analysis we did. So how many people here have had a, a relative or themselves gone to a hospital and the complicated procedure X actually went pretty well? 
but the patient almost died from a, an infection they got in the hospital. It's not uncommon. Turns out that, that it, it, one in 20 hospitalizations are linked to these uh, hospital-associated infections. These infections are a top 10 contributor of death in the United States. We've applied this, these methods of, of looking at 30,000 variables and reasoning and decision making to identifying patients at risk of getting, for example, C. difficile, Clostridium difficile, a nasty diarrheal infection in advance of them getting sick. And to show you the model we use, it turns out, if you think about it, a patient comes into the hospital, and you'll see why I'm, I have different sized red dots here, and they get checked in, they go to a hospital bed, they get surgery, they go to post-op, they're moving around the hospital. I just, I just uh, here, I've, I've sorted through so for, for anonymization, the kind of one patient what they, in a hospital, they go to different places in the hospital. And it turns out that you have varying susceptibility and exposure, and both these influences, you can imagine, would affect the probability of getting sick in the hospital. In fact, uh, one of the key variables in our analysis, it turned out, was something we called, we computed, called colonization pressure. What you see here is our three wings of, of the hospital in DC, uh, 2C, wing 4G, and wing 4F, and we're computing how many people are infected already with this illness when you show up as the fresh patient coming out of the operating room. And that's a factor because it's, 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 a, it's an indication of the exposure you're getting over time. And it turns out that if you actually build in time-indexed models that actually look at the accrual of the exposure over time, you can have a better uh, curve, more area into that curve of the true positives and false positives here. And this paper in detail is on our website. I see people squirming in their seats about this, this, this hospital with the infection all around here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, Yuta Pearl's in the audience, and he's the master of causality. I want to say another consideration that's really critical is causation. Let me show you an example here. Um, so here are some variables that came up as top of the list when it came to patients at risk for getting sick in the hospital. Being in 2G, having diabetes, um, a certain medication that created lots of a stir in our group, like, wow, wow, patients that are getting this medication seem to be getting infected, and we know that these opiates affect intestinal motility. We didn't see much in the literature on that. But look at this. Attending physician, attending physician code XXXX. Is this Dr. Typhoid Mary, who's touching the patients? Well, it turns out that that MD was the, she was the head of the ICE intensive care unit. They get the hardest patients there. So before we start doing studies of who is at the top and bottom of this list, who are the, you know, who's washing their hands, we have to sort of ask questions about doing causal studies. It's very critical. And methods being developed here at UCLA and other places um, are, are, look, are getting into that, that whole area of, of the causal structure behind a phenomena like risk of illness. I've got to put a little Utah picture up here. Okay. Now I wanted to just head to another pillar. The last pillar I'll talk about is humans and machines. This is a very exciting thing for me to think about how can people and machines team together. This is the future of where AI is really going, as opposed to all the scary stories of autonomous takeovers and machines. I think it's going to be a, a beautiful teaming and augmentation over time. And in fact, what I'm really excited about is the fact that uh, there's a big promise for machine learning and inference to help us with this weave. Um, so, um, there's a notion of not just complementarity, but also how do you coordinate a mix of initiatives among machines and people? So for example, let's say this blue problem, calling this a problem, this blob is a problem. Someday a machine will say, you know, I see alpha and beta there. I can decompose that and I won't touch alpha. That's human. But I can help with, with beta and I'm going to communicate that and then do that and then recurse. So it's an interesting idea of how do you automate this? How do you do this in a, how do you rebuild doctoral theses around this topic? How do we field these machines in the world that would help people in, in a variety of ways? So I'll give you one simple example, just to whet your appetite. Um, and this is um, work that we've done in our, on our team with citizen science and looking at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this is a, a big survey of the heavens of about a million galaxies, uh, you know, a quarter of a million stars and 120,000 quasars that uh, was too big for astronomers, for experts to look at and tag. 
but they can learn a lot from citizen scientists who go to a website and train up and then vote on what they see uh, as they see different instances in the website here. And it turns out that uh, there's a big volunteer database of 34 million votes by 100,000 people to date. People have voted on these things. And actual science comes out of these pieces of work, um, uh, helping us understand the heavens. Probably need about 100,000 extra authors on this. But um, what we noticed was that, that, that some folks, in fact at Maryland, have actually applied machine vision procedures to that data set. So, in fact, about 453 features that these were featureized. Uh, I should say that you know, pre-deep learning features, um, these, these interesting uh, kind of uh, spatial frequencies and so on, these uh, kind of technical features about what's being seen by the machine vision system. And we asked the question, if we had machine perception and human perception and wanted to minimize scarce human attention, and we had kind of people waiting to help us, and we have our simple little machine vision algorithm that's giving us the parameters and the states of, those, of, those, uh, of, each, of each heavenly object, could we actually run a system that would optimize and figure out when it is the case we want to ask a person versus just go with the machine or combinations thereof? And could we actually do ideal fusion of the information from both sides and stopping rules? And so what you see here is a piece of a, of a, of a, of, of a Bayesian structure search derived um, predictive model that jointly is reasoning about at any point in time, what's the correct answer if you stop now of what this, this galaxy or star is? And if you ask person X, and X can change, what would their next vote be given all the votes so far? And so it's considering parameters that capture the status of the current votes that came in from many people. Uh, it's considering um, notions of, of those, those features from the machine vision and um, even personalized data about each person and how well they can see different things over time. And you actually use this joint, these two variables that I'm highlighting here, the correct answer and next vote, in a simulation that does Monte Carlo tree search. And it continues to ask the question by simulating how much is it worth hiring somebody? Turns out myopic value of information, to those who know what I mean, doesn't work very well. You have to look out quite a distance to see the value. And by doing this, we can get full accuracy with about half the human effort. Done well, done right with machine learning to do the weave, and 95% of the accuracy with a quarter of the human effort. For why are we doing this more, for more of our projects across everything that we do as, hum as human beings? Machines and people working coherently together with decision theoretic analyses uh, guided by machine learning on data sets. I should say that we're now going to end by talk, talking about some deeper collaborations that are possible. Um, you see here uh, some surgeons uh, around a Da Vinci machine. I wanted to say, I want to point out some work by Greg Hager, a close colleague at Johns Hopkins, who uh, he and Carol Riley have a project here a few years ago where they were looking at, can I look through the surgical uh, lens and actually induce a grammar of surgery positioning, inserting, uh, loosening, uh, orienting. And based on that grammar, then build a system that can actually do a joint, think about that blob again with the alpha and beta, a joint sharing of here's the surgeon uh, going into some piece of dough here, it's not real tissue. And then the machine takes over here, does the kind of the pull in the auto mode. And it's a back and forth volley learned from the vision work you saw earlier. Now, this seems a little you know, it's just dough and it's far out, but just a week and a half ago, this came out of uh, Sheikh Zayed Hospital, a pediatric hospital in DC, a real hard challenge making an anastomosis, which the way uh, surgeons repair intestines, for example, uh, just showing a, a, a machine working with people. It's a little bit sped up, but not that much sped up here. Um, and watch them, the robotic system work with the person, almost like, a, almost like a, another hand in the surgery. And it's using an infrared uh, machine vision, uh, infrared illuminated machine vision procedure here to uh, actually identify edges and borders. And what the article says, you can read about it in, in Science Translational Medicine last week, that they can do really fine grained regular stitches now with the human helping, the machine helping the human being right now. So it's pretty impressive how far we came from 
Carol Riley and Greg Hager's work just a couple of years ago to now, again, this is not a real, you know, this is, a, this is probably a piece of uh, animal tissue here, but we're getting there. It's very interesting to see. Someone asked me at lunch today, maybe it was Rich Korf, how long, I, hope, I, hope to, I hate to attribute it to him if he didn't say this, how long will it be until you get in trouble if you don't have a machine doing the surgery or helping you? Uh, if it's just a human being doing the surgery, it's, it's kind of risky. Uh, so where are we going with this? And it's to, it's to deeper collaboration. So we imagine someday you're in your kitchen and you're working on a recipe and you load the recipe into the system and it knows you're working on it. And it's just watching you, oh, oh go, oh, go ahead, pour it, no, slow it, slower, slower. And Susan can make the butter while you're doing that and a system that's helping you coordinate. And, or someday you, know, you, you want to go out, your grandkids are going out to the movies and your great grandkids are at home and you leave them with the robots and you're just happy, they'll be, happy. They'll be great. It's, it, it, you, these are robust systems someday. And so one vision on pulling this off, we, we say it's integrative AI. And it, it talks about the idea that we've made such great um, progress in vision and speech and some in planning, uh, inference, social skills. Many of these, th these advances happen and are reported in, in different conferences that are separated. And is there an interesting vision of bringing together these pieces into greater holes that are bigger than the sum of the parts and having new kinds of services? So this is um, a few years ago now, but we actually, Dan Bowis and I, uh, worked together to, to film what the experience was like. If you, were a if you were a receptionist at Microsoft Research Building 99 in the lobby, what you deal with daily here when people come to, the, to see you. And we actually had signs up that said, you know, we're recording, so we, we dealt with our lawyers and the privacy issues, don't worry about that part. Um, but based on that, we said, well, it's really kind of complicated what goes on in the open world of social discourse. Like here's um, the people that, that the, maybe the, the receptionist is attending to and people are on hold or they're actually engaged. Uh, people are coming and going, different relationships. It's really kind of an interesting pattern over time, what, what's going on. And we sat down and we said, okay, what, what's some hardware? Let's build some, let's assemble some system that can see and hear and act and build um, a little a system here that could be like a receptionist. And I won't show you that right now, but the idea is um, uh, a video can actually uh, understand what we're wearing, where we're looking, um, understand that someone's waiting. While we're talking, it can actually ask the other person to hang on a second. It sees that person there, so it's doing multi-party inference in a, in a larger setting. We ended up actually fielding this system in our reception area over time to help with scheduling shuttles and finding people. Now, um, when I walk to my office these days, this is an older version of the system. I have a, a, an assistant by my door. Fire. No one has stopped by to see you since we last talked. And Outlook Mobile Manager is still down, so I'm not seeing messages from your email. Catch you later. So what's fun about building the assistant as a secretary by my door is that it uses, if you go back in the UAI proceedings, you'll see, or an AMIS, there are components we built over the years. Prioritization of email, predicting where I'm going to be next, separate papers. We've brought them together as, as, a, as a layering of services uh, in a way that provides a new kind of experience. I want to show you what, what this is like in the open world. I got permission to show this video. That's why I showed, a couple, I showed it quite a bit because we often look at permission. This was an intern that came to see me wasn't my intern, was leaving the next day, wanted to chat, was a little bit nervous, and here's what, 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 what the experience of the system looking out was like. So you had this like.
So, <laughs> so it gives you a sense for the glimmer, even though it's clunky right now, where things might be going someday. If you come visit us today at Milling 99 at, at MSR, you'll see three projects here right now. I'll show you right now that where we are today with the, the technologies. These are all built on the same technology base. The elevator, which is like Star Trek, uh, and the robot that giving directions, and my current assistant. The system is actually generating plans dynamically based on the floor plan of the building. And language model comes from the same Hi. world. I was expecting you. The robot told me you were coming. Are you here looking for Eric? Yes. Are you here for the five o'clock meeting with Eric? Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you were here for that meeting. Could you please swipe your patch? Eric is not here at the moment. Let me look at his calendar to see if I can tell where he is. His calendar says he should be at a meeting in his office now, so I'm actually not sure where he is. He will probably be back in around 15 minutes or so. Would you like to leave him a note, or maybe come back later? Or come back later. Okay, you could try sending him an email message. I expect him to look at his email in around 10 minutes. Guess I'll see you later then. Bye bye. Thank you. Two people stopped by to see you. I said you'd be back in around 15 minutes. Great. Catch you later. Bye bye. So, so as a last consideration, I wanted to just say that it's really hard in these systems to get natural and fluid with people, especially fast-paced dialogue or work in surgery or the kinds of collaborations. And this is a big challenge for us as a, as a community. Um, we have a really nice paper that I'd love to re recommend to people interested in the fluidity problem, which is looking at the, 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 the time critical uh, decision problem of, of the back and forth. And I'll stop in one second. Give me one second. We're going to end right now for general Q&A. But um, another aspect is this back channel that psychologists of conversation talk about. The back channel which, which, which can be looked um, at by people in a conversation to understand uncertainty and perception uh, in a state of a conversation and so on. So what you see here is a trace. I'm not going to go into details on it right now, but let me just say that this was a trace that we've looked at to understand failures and confusions at three different levels. At the level of perception, at the level of including spoken words being said and uh, vision, uh, at the level of conversational flow, like what's happening in the conversation, and at level of engagement. And we spent a summer with an intern uh, and an artist working on muscles to say, how can I convert this view, this developer's view, into a natural back channel for people to look, to look at and know what's going on without knowing the code? And here's what it looks like. This is an ICMI paper last year. That's that graph operating dynamically in her facial expression. Is one of you John? Yes. Sorry, I can't tell who is speaking when you stand <laughs> One of you said there, John. I did. Right. Hi, John. That is expecting you. Will you be joining the meeting? Sir. Sorry, <laughs> you the meeting. Yes. Alright, I let that know you will be joining this meeting with John. I'm sorry. I think that is running a little bit late. I'm pretty sure he's on his way. 
Just to be safe, I'll send you a note to let him know that you're here. Feel free to have a seat while you wait for him. Yes, I'll see you later then. Bye bye. So um, it, it's a much more natural view than the graph, don't you think? Um, get a sense for the back channel. And this is where things are going, to really have systems that can talk to us about the multiple levels of uncertainty in a natural way. And it takes quite a bit of engineering. So I wanted to stop here and to say that I showed you transportation, healthcare, some very, very basic examples with some considerations on each, and people and machines. I see rich benefits for people in society ahead. Uh, I wanted to show you a view from that balloon just to end with here. Uh, and I'll stop there for Q&A. There's a hand waving back there. So thanks very much. So the first hand was up, yeah. And you'll have to index the two slides ago. Sorry about that. Thank you. Right, so the whole goal, the, the project is called Situated Interaction, and it's all about open world social discourse. So we know what we want to do, we know it would be natural, and that's the aspiration. You can imagine, and some of these things are working magically right now, and some we have on hold till later. We're actually redoing the whole infrastructure. We're building actually a, a framework we call PSI, backslash PSI in tech, but it's Greek letter PSI as a programming language and modeling system to enable our academic partners and us to basically build systems like this with ease. And that's good, we, get, we have, uh, we're much working with our, a bunch of academics as well, as well now, running on Linux and ROS, don't worry about only Windows, and uh, we wanna get this out into the world. So we're, we put everything on pause right now with refining these systems further until we have the new tool set. But yes, the idea is to really go for it and to make it much more natural. When I come back right now, um, little things like, to answer your question a bit better here, so, Little things we don't notice, like memory, short-term and long-term, are powerful and, and hard to program. So, it, for example, it, it took us a chunk of a summer of an intern to introduce into the assistant just the kind of memory that we expect in people. And I remember the day I was working, I came back up to my office, hey, Eric, long time no see. Yep. I said, wow, the system is immersed and situated in time now and understands how to ground with me about the time since it last saw me and being a longer than usual period. Um, so we expect when people come back, back to your question, depending on the time constant, oops, hang on a second. Eric is, uh, he came back and he left again. I'm so sorry about that. And to understand people and their return to a, to a system. We have demos of that actually running uh, on our website. Yeah. Did the system pass the Turing test? Pass the Turing test. <laughs> What does it mean to pass a super Turing test better than humans? I don't know. I mean, I mean this, these systems are still pretty clunky in this day and age. Um, uh, we, we, we were talking at lunchtime with the students about when will it be, we can, we can reflect together as, as a group, when will it be, what year will it be when there's a regulation that systems like this have to disclose within the first 15 seconds of operation that they're not people? Like, like kind of surgeon's general warning of the future. Hey, uh, let me, uh, sorry, I know it sounds funny, but I'm not a person, I gotta tell you that. And uh, I, I think that'll happen in our lifetimes because I think it'll be probably a requirement for a, m a number of reasons. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, David, David, David. <laughs>